Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are in episode number 33, and I have yet another amazing guest with me today on the Zoom call is Mike Simmons from Meridian Hive, and uh, he's here to chat with us all about Meridian Hive, his own mead experience, and everything he's got going on in his world. Mike, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Hey, so um, I want to first dive in and have you tell us about Meridian Hive. For anybody who doesn't know who you are, what's your uh, elevator pitch? Elevator pitch. Well, we are a meadery in Austin, Texas, and we got started. Our first product release was November of 2013 and uh, started with 500 gallon tanks and a 500 gallon bright tank. And we have multiple 45 barrel tanks and a 260 barrel bright tanks at this point. So it's a, we've made a big move to volume at this point, but I think our specialty within the mead community is the light carbonated lower alcohol comparatively to what most people consider mead. If you ask you know, people from the Renaissance Fair, they're gonna say the big full strength, typically pretty sweet. And then no one was really making the, the cider equivalent, the, the highly drinkable kind. And so we went that path uh, from the, nearly the very beginning. That was like the one thing we thought would set us apart from everybody else. Yeah, so you guys started with that. You didn't start with your 10% plus. You guys were kicking it pretty low from the beginning. We did both of them in the very beginning because when we were developing the business model and you go start doing the market research in 2012, there was no market research to be had. So we had to look for equivalents out there. Like who's drinking red wine? Who's drinking sweet red wine? Who's drinking the ciders? Who's drinking the Bartles and James? Who's drinking Mike's hard lemonade and try to like dissect that crowd a bit because those are the people that we think we were trying to replace their daily drinker. Most of those people had a thing they liked a whole lot. And so, if we wanted to grow, we decided to go big or go home. We, we started out with, we're in the same facility still that we started off uh, in 2012. And so we've kind of, we've capped, we've actually overflowed from that from this point. But at that time, it was 3,300 square feet, which was uh, quite a bit of warehouse space for comparatively to most people starting out of metery. But we had pretty small tanks, so we decided we were going to grow into it. Uh, yeah. No. So how do you get those metrics? I, I, I don't know if this is too much. Uh, how do you get the metrics to know red wine drinkers, you know, who's drinking Mike's Hard Lemonade? So one of the things that we did, uh, I'm, my background is engineering, and I didn't have much of a business pack. My partner at the time had better business acumen than I did. I just had a product and could do production planning. So the, the, the engineering mechanism of the whole scaling up homebrew was the interest of mine and what I felt I could handle more often than that. But we went to, I guess it was a Texas State Small Business Development Center. It was a, basically a free program uh, that you could get a, an advisor. And we had several advisors. Some were better than others. Mostly they help you try to get SBA loans and things online. But one of the things I can take away from that is that he told us two things. Uh, one was that the people that you sell to, that you directly change hands with, that is a customer of yours. That is like a market segment, like how you treat your buyers and what you, the communication you have between them is completely different than how you communicate to the people you actually want to pull it off the store shelves because you have to almost always go through them. And if you can't get those guys to buy it from you, you have to, you have to sell them first. And then they have to know downstream who's important. Um, so that was one thing. It was like IDing those guys was another thing. Um, raising money was the other thing. He said, for a long time, you'll be, they call it the hockey stick. You know, if you hear about that, but that whole downward area backwards up is called the valley of death. And that's where most small businesses go to die because you run out of money, you're undercapitalized. So those things like that, kind of how did we get started with that? It was mostly through this small development center that we had an advisor and we were trying to get loans. And we still, we, we developed a business, we learned more about a business plan and who could go big context for that whole rolling it over to a, a building a company. So does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's great. I just honestly had never, um, I never heard someone talk about that. Obviously market research is the um, behind the scenes stuff that no one really th uh, talks about a lot. It definitely happens, but that's just, I I'm not an engineer, mm -hmm. but my brain is like obsessive in that stuff like that. I would go down this rabbit hole and I would, I could find myself uh, lost in it super easy, but we won't, we won't dwell on that. I was just kind of curious. Um, so you said, I, I don't know if I, if you mentioned your, uh, when you guys started producing, but what year did you start producing? 
at Meridian? We signed the lease on the property of October, uh, August of 2012. Mm -hmm. And then we got the certificate of occupancy nine months later. It took that long for us to get the place up and going and up to speed so everybody can sign off. And then so we started producing in August and we were mostly just learning the process. Like, don't screw anything up. Honey is really expensive. We're going big on this stuff. And how long did it take us to ferment it? How much to get it packaged? That whole first scroll through everything. Because my partner and I did not come from this, this field. We did not come from beverage or food manufacturing. I came from other kinds. And he came from, he's a software guy. So it's mm. like two, two, two knowledgeable home brewers who were pretty smart and who had a decent business kind of skills between the two of us worked pretty well. I mean, we got it to a level and then kicked it off to another level. So, um, yeah, well, that's awesome. Yeah. So really only eight or nine years in, um, obviously, you know, COVID it's, we, we can go down that rabbit hole maybe later, but uh, I feel like, uh, COVID has probably added new challenges to your world that have only made you guys stronger in your field. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, 2020 was one of our best years. Uh, comparatively to everybody else. Uh, huh. we, we used to do mobile canning. And when all the brew pubs um, couldn't sell their all their stuff, all their tanks full, they started occupying the time of the canning guys that we were using. So we were really loose with our... So we just started tightening up when we had a new production schedule and like we had to be ready on that day or whatever buffer days we had. It was like much, much more hard. And we ended up buying our own canning line because of it. So... Uh, your wow. buddy who showed up to see the tasting room. We don't have a tasting room until we move to a new facility, which is, you know, time undisclosed uh, until we do that because we put a canning line right in the middle of where people normally sat. So hey, that's exciting though. Oh uh, yeah, it's totally, I mean, it's, it's sweet. We have our own control of like when we can schedule our own stuff. So we used to can about three to four, basically once a week. And we're up to five, almost six times a month. Uh, so we're trying to get to the point of canning twice a week to get the volumes up because basically we're out of stock. We, we can sell more than we have the facilities to be able to produce right now. So it's the, it's the, it's the good kind of problem, but it's like, ah, trying to yeah. raise money on top of that in the middle of COVID with everybody falling out. So it's just a, it's a weird time, but it's a weird time for us in a way that's different than a lot of people. So, yeah. Well, um, so you guys are, I mean, I'm not going to say new. Nine years is still a long time. Do you have a product that you still make to this day from that 2012 time? Or have you? I like to say no one gets to pick their champion. That happens for beers like to you put a portfolio and whatever the, wh whoever gravitate, you start looking at sales and what comes up. It's like, well, that sells more. Do you push it more? Do you just make more? Is it, is it a fluke? How long do you forecast out? And you just keep having everything with the, the growth of the forecasting of like, how much more will I be able to sell than I did the previous? How, you know, that's the goals you set up, the metrics and uh, the business side of things. And so our Blackberry, which is like this, mm -hmm. it's uh, basically the, the original one. One of the three, we are, what, in our product portfolio, we have, we have a honey, we have a Blackberry, and we have a tropical, which is a seasonal one. Tropical is not exactly the same that we started off, but we started off with honey, which is just to showcase orange blossom honey. And the blackberries, blackberry is one of my favorite fruit uh, besides cherry. And so I wanted to make a strong, no one really had a blackberry character uh, in, in like ciders that was a really, no one dominated with that. And I happened to formulate one early on. And when we started refining my recipes on that line, they were like, boom, this one's going to be great for people that like sweet red wine. It's like a sangria replacement. It's a, an analog, right? Because mm -hmm. You have to think about that with the products that you make. It's you're trying to get people are walking into a bottle sh uh, bottle shop with twenty dollars, just average Joe. Depends on how many people you want to like. You want to reach the most amount of people. Average Joe, twenty dollars. He's going to go with their beer, wine, cider, um, liquor, charcuterie, cheese, mm -hmm. maybe mead. Mead's way down there, so you're having a hard time. How do you get him to stop spending that twenty dollars on what he was going there for and switch gears to something else? So. I decided that I had to make analogs that were similar to what they wanted. Then you push them, you try to set up near where they are when you're sampling. They come by the area and you're like, hey, you should try it. If you like this, try this. And they're like, oh, that's pretty awesome. We also did the farmer's market for a long time, which was 
getting people to actually taste it and good, good feedback to see the repeat customers without really going super huge uh, before we started, you know, it's been a lot. We've done a lot of different things in nine years, um, but yeah. where we from and where we are today, a lot, a lot of things. So what's really interesting about that to me, um, uh, your point of people tasting it is like mm. obviously it's the first step, but I think that's what most people don't understand about mead is that they have no concept of what it really is. When you tell them um, it's honey wine, there's their perception of that becomes oh, it's just going to taste like a super sweet beverage that you know, it doesn't have any other flavors or yada, yada. So there's like, um, thanks to you guys. And thanks to people who are coming out with, uh, I I would say like good stair steppers into that heavy, heavy, heavy mead stuff. Like we are able to get the word out about mead more often, which is important. uh, For in the beginning, we had to figure out, so marketing, we're a new category. The grand scheme of things is a very crowded alcoholic beverage market, right? And so there's lots of breweries, lots of wineries. Everybody's chomping for that $20. And mm-hmm. so how do you have to do marketing on the category? And it's really hard to break through with a new category. We spend a lot of time. Then you have to also market to your brand. So you generally say all meat is great, but we, you should try our stuff. So farmer's market gave me a couple of things. One is that you would say, hey, would you like to try some meat? And people would say, no, I don't like it. It's like, well, we tried our kind. Like, oh, 90% of people were like, well, oh, that's way better than I expected. It's a very light kind that we were doing on the carbonated kind. And they were like, oh, it's different than what you can get at the Renaissance fairs, which is most people's access to it. And they're like, oh, and they're like, what's the difference? Um, another thing is I could, I could generally tell what kind of conversation I was going to have. Or out of the wild, people ask me, what do I do? I have my business. Well, what does it do? It's food manufacturing. What kind of food do you do? I do alcohol. I will, what kind of alcohol? It's like alcohol made from honey. If they say, do you mean mead? That conversation is entirely different from what's a honey beer. And like, okay, I got to explain a lot about like, I can just immediately make that divergence of what kind of conversation I'm about to have to explain the position. So repeating the portfolio over and over again at the farmer's market. So you have a lot of interaction uh, and the word mead. Uh, how many times I'm starting a meadery. You say, I'm starting a meadery. Meadery, do you mean a butcher shop? Do you guys do charcuterie? Um, so in the enunciation of the word mead is very important. I've learned to do that quite a bit and try to yeah. say it. Farmer's market is good. Just want to cut it in here real fast and say, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support the channel, feel free to check out manmademead.com. It's the one-stop shop to find recipes, brewing information, all of the YouTube series, and Amazon affiliate links that support the channel. You can simply click on the links, and when you purchase through that link, it actually a, a part of the profit goes back to the channel and helps me continue to create content for you all. So I hope you will join me there, and thanks for listening. Back to the show. So you've got really good at the elevator pitch, and you, I mean, your your sales tactics are probably very sharp. Right done now. a lot, and I just try to be real. Like you kind of said, it's like we tried to put I. Okay, roll back to my history. Like 2007, I saw somebody making beer in their house. And I was like, how did I not know this was a thing? And I bought, I, I made three all grain, uh, three extract batches. And then I immediately bought somebody's uh, Kegel uh, all grain system. And I joined the Austin Zealots, which is like a free to join, but they're full of awesome, great quality brewers. And so they're just like, tech talk all day long. There's no, there's no clickiness in there. Anyway, I went there and I was like, well, what do you guys do besides share beer and, uh, you know, to hang out? They go, we can enter competitions. And I was like, I'm in my first beer, you know, competition. And I was like, Oh boy, there are 67 subcategories of beer. And immediately from that point on, I said, well, I have a lot of beer to make. And so I did. And I went for a long time. I probably made over 250 batches of beer, tried all, made all the styles. Uh, I'm a national BJCP judge, uh, but I do mead as well. So I mostly have judged mead at Mazer Cup a lot over the last like six, seven years. Uh, I pretty much go there every year. Um, and so I got along to the point where I made everything pretty good. And my first exposure to mead was not through Renaissance Fair, but through uh, judging. So they asked me to come over to a big competition in Houston. It's like, okay, we need you over here to judge mead. And I was like, I don't know anything about this stuff. I've never made it before ever. I listened to Ken Schramm's podcast on Brewing Network one time and about making mead. And he was like, so I, I kind of knew a little bit about it. And I was like, that's kind of interesting. Make everything out of honey. And they had me judge it. And the first epiphany I had is like, I got the first thing I judged was a blueberry blossom traditional. 
And I was like, but didn't know anything about it. I was like, blueberry blossom. I was expecting like a, a melmel. And I got it and I was like, man, this is really unique. It's really well made, no off flavors. Um, but there's no blueberry on it. So I was like, I don't know what to expect. It's like, it has this unique flavor to it. And I was, you know, make your scores kind of settled. And you just ask the other judge, like, I was really disappointed there was no blueberry. He's like, well, it's made from the honey before the fruit is made. It's from the flower. And I was like, you know, I never really thought about that at all. And I was like, Boom. it was like, that's a varietal honey. Okay. And I was like, well, how many, like, oh, there's a bunch of plants, but not all of them exposed by bees and people have to, I started thinking in my head. I was like, well, how many are there in the United States? He's like, I don't know, 300. And I was like, man. And to me, that was a changeover for like having a new base malt for a beer. It was like, you have you know, two row and you have like Pilsner and you have two row. That's the two general ones. But now I had 300 different base malts. I was like, man, buying one gallon of honey on the internet and making a three gallon batch with nine pounds of it and the other three to back sweet. So that was a very general traditional thing for me to do. I got pretty good with already new fermentation control. So I had all that stuff. I was making good quality stuff. Now it's a wine making process in the front of that. And there was all these weird techniques of adding nutrients. There was degassing it. I was like, Ooh, this is kind of weird. So I made a couple of wines that did pretty well, made some ciders, but it all came from like learning mead, which was a nutrient wasteland. It was all this. It's the only uh, fermentable sugar that doesn't come from um, a plant, you know, barley, grapes, apples, honey is mostly sucrose. That's been, uh, inverted by the bees and they make uh, glucose and fructose. So it's like, oh, that's got its own problems. So uh, that's what the and in allure yeah. was for me to do this. And so I made me, I won a bunch of stuff and then went down. My regular drinking crew would be a bunch of guys and a couple of women. And one of the guys was drinking white wine with the women and pacing was a little bit weird. And we went to that different bar. And then back in 2012, the bar we went to had like 75 beer taps, two of them were non-beer and it was two ciders. And after a week, whatever, like two weeks, they were like, I'm so over cider. They'd had my meat, my full strength meat. And they said, can you make your meat drinkable like a cider and maybe make it commercially? I've been working on a blue club uh, business model. I was like, you know, that's really intriguing. I don't know if I can do that. And I made it. And uh, at the time I was making way too much booze because I was trying to refine a bunch of recipes. And uh, I keg dragged that to like uh, you know, band, band parties and whatnot. And people would crush the carbonated meads sometimes faster than beer. And I was like, what's up with that? And people were just novelty. This is good. Try this. You got to try this. And different crowds, people tried. So it was men and women. I was like, mm, I'm very intrigued by this. Like, is it actually a sellable product to people I don't really know? You know, it's kind of like all the bands bring their own friends. It's a very big mingling kind of thing. So it's like, I didn't know everybody there, but I thought that was, the, that was my first tidbit of blind, uh, Consciousness, not because there's just alcohol there, but they had an option of two different alcohols and they still chose that at a faster rate. I don't know, you know, so it was very intriguing. I don't know if it was novelty or whatnot, but that's how this whole ball got rolling. Is that man? I, I think that um uh, I, I love your, your progression of going from beer to <laughs> you you saying uh honey is a nutrient wasteland it's just like such a perfect i've never heard it said that way it's just a perfect way to describe honey because you're right there's there's a lot of advanced techniques but um that progression of beer to mead and then you learning so much about every other alcohol from mead is very intriguing to me in general um well, just i realized the, the difference on you know, the difference between a brewery and a winery commercially is that a brewer cannot go out and grab barley and make beer immediately from that. He has to go through the malting process in order to get there. And like, you'll still have to do the conversion of the starches to sugars over that. But everything on the wine side, if you harvest it, it's ready to go. It's got the sugar content and the acidity you need at the time to bring it over. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like the big delineation. And there's a difference. There's no hot side to wine making or mead making really. It doesn't have to be, or cider making. It's just like you get fresh, cold sugar and boom, let it go. So, so I want to do this a little bit different. Since we're kind of talking about Right now, your your personal mead making experience in the beginning. I want to talk about some of these questions, and we'll at the end we'll start, we'll talk about more Meridian stuff. When you first started, um, and you were making all of these different kinds of honey, um, obviously varietals and things. I'm assuming you made lots of mellow mels. Um, did you find or experiment with? putting fruit in primary versus secondary? Did you ever like land on a favorite or do you use both? Where are you at with that? So uh, I have tried on the front end, the back end. Uh, that, uh, if you're making a dry mead, 
I think you're not really going to put anything on the – well, it depends. I tend to make my higher strength stuff on the small craft batches. Like most of our stuff that was bottled and corked, uh, I would put fruit in primary and not very often put it in secondary. Uh, unless it was like coconut or something I couldn't really – things that didn't taste very good if it was fermented. But other than that, we would do that. For our low strength stuff, we, we added in – after the fact. So we only ferment honey. Basically it's traditional with fruit added to it after the fact. So, but I do it the opposite way. So do I have a preference? There's something to be said for fruit that's been partially digested by yeast because it makes the yeast either sometimes push esters or other it's components that the yeast have to chew on. And it's not a cooked, it depends on your fruit combo. Uh, it's not as fresh because it's the sugar has been depleted. So if you want to bring the sugar content back up so that you can get the full volume. So it really depends on what, where the mead ends. So there's some fruit like raspberries, black currants that really sweet or dry. They still have a strong flavor profile, like strawberries, not the answer because if you've ever had a dry strawberry, oh. it smells like a field of strawberries and you taste it you're like, man, that is a, as a rough, as a rough drink. That's yeah. very acidic, and uh, but so some of them don't hold up. Other ones do hold up. A lot, of, a lot of dark berries hold up pretty well for making it dry. Where I don't usually put a lot of stuff in the back end of that, but it's a, it's just a fresher character, I suppose. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that about uh, strawberries because I've been doing. Uh, I got some coriander blossom honey, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting, and uh, I wanted to pair it with something, so I did a strawberry and cinnamon. Put the strawberries in the primary, and just like you said, that that strawberry taste coming out of that primary is like. Uh, it, it's got something funky. Um, the, the yeast had a heyday with it and not exactly in the best way possible. So I don't have data to say that this, the post fermentation stage or whatever would be better, but, um, I but definitely, experiments are for. yeah, I definitely track with what you're saying. So on that note, is there a fruit that you found, um, maybe along the same lines as strawberry is hardest to work with? I love mango, but you can only really uh, commercially, you can only, um, cause there's too much volume to, have to like go chop it up and try to get the ripest mango. But mango is a, anything with a big slurry mess. Like it's got a lot of fibrous material. Just always a big pain. Even if you put it in a homebrew level where you're putting like the nylon paint stringer bag and you're putting all your fruit in there, you pull it out. It's, it's so coconuts also like coconut flake is also a hard one to deal with because it just, it's repel. First of all, it makes it oil and it repels everything. So it's really hard to get it soaked out. But anything that's like pulpy like that. Uh, I did a, you ever heard of pawpaw? You, I don't know. I've heard of it. Yes, yes, yes. Pawpaw. So we did a pawpaw mead and that was also had a very mango like super fibrous kind of squishy fruit that was also a big pain to, to really press out. Um, so yeah. those other, other, you, by flavor profiles, you think? Is that what you meant by that are difficult? Uh, to yeah, work? either way. I mean, in, in complexity Co of use or uh, anything. Like how about coffee? So coffee is an interesting one. So I found coffee in secondary gives off that cup of coffee kind of roasted smell to it. If you put coffee in primary, the yeast love caffeine. And it makes them total double time even at normal standardized temperatures. Huh. The flavor profile that comes out of it is like the kind of dark red and purple chilies that you would use to like mix Mexican chili powder. Those, hmm. when they're dried, it gives that small chili flavor to it. That's always there. It's almost like, it's like putting any kind of green thing in there where you have a lot of chlorophyll and you get that bell pepper kind of character to it. Coffee will make it taste like dried peppers like chili peppers but not like you know cayenne or anything like that but just like dried chili peppers so that's the other one that's like kind of a difficult one to dial in to get a good flavor profile out of that so everybody's yeah. cool anyway, but. i tried a coffee mead one time and i did it three ways uh, I, my big downfall with it was i just used too much coffee in general but i did uh, i brewed coffee did hot coffee and then used that as the honey and, and honey is the base and then i put coffee grounds in the primary for one and to put coffee grounds in the secondary post fermentation stage. And, um, I think had I not used as much coffee grounds, it would have been better, but it was like, I mean, it was like just 
shoving your face full of, of coffee beans and chewing down. It was not good. So I want to repeat that at some point. Right, right. <laughs> These are a lot of experiments, right? You have to start yes. down as you start scaling up and you're like, all right, I'm going on this one. I'm going to piloting is, I think that maybe one thing you were curious about is like, how do you pilot some of these things? And I was doing one-off batches. So I'd pilot it like a one, one gallon just to get a flavor profile. All right, is this all right? Uh, with stuff I could find, like I would actually get the fruit and chop it up and like macerate it as much as I could for one gallon. To, Cause then I have my suppliers where I get, uh, we most, we use a lot of concentrates for most of our canned products just because it's practical for time. Yeah. Other than that, we get IQF. I get. I would try to get individually quick frozen or IQF fruit as much as possible. So whoever my supplier was, I had to pilot with a small sample batch from them to go, okay, how long? And each one of those is you know at least a three-week lead to, uh, between the time that I need them. So my pilots have to kind of like run, I have to be on top of that project a long time before I'm just going for it. And then, you know, there's always, every time you scale up from carboys to a big tank, I got a pump and pump doesn't like, you know, now how am I going to deal with like 80 gallons of puree? It's like, geez, where's my yield yeah. gone? It's completely gone. I'm trying to fill up like a barrel at like <laughs> at 60 gallons. So I have to make, you know, you gotta, I've never worked with this stuff before other than a carboy and I'm measuring how much it drops when I crash cool it. And I'm like, all right, that's about 20%. I'm going to lose that much volume in this size surface area. You got to do all these calculations for it and try to guesstimate. How much over you make? Because if you, if you don't underfill the barrel, barrel, that sucks. If you overfill the barrel, you probably want yeah, you know, like three gallons extra. That would be ideal over the, so you can top it up if you're gonna age it for a long time. Mm -hmm. But if you have like 15 gallons over, you're like, oh man, I call it, I, I yielded too much. And um, so that's an interesting thing about doing scaling up. I uh um, so I guess we're gonna we're gonna divert a little bit do you do a big like um base like do you have a, a base mead and then you start to add your flavorings in for our our canned products yes yeah that's okay and uh yeah that's pretty much the the, the best way to do it because i can always get clean i can always we buy our we use orange blossom exclusively and we have a good partnership with a, a, a reasonably large Mexican apiary, uh, south of Texas, you know, just on the, near the border of Texas and uh, Mexico. And so we get about 40 tons. Uh, then it'll last us about seven months at our current burn rate. So we go through quite a bit. It's basically 14 totes of honey. And that, that goes, that, that, that lasts us about seven months. But the more volume we're doing, it's, it's winding down. It's more like every six months we go through that much. Do you have like a, I don't know what they call it. Is it a hot room or something where you can put that honey to heat up? Cause I'm guessing some of it's crystallized by the time you get to it. We used to, since we only deal with the totes now, uh, the totes, you know, you were talking about by IDC totes, got the cage with the plastic thing inside there. Yes. Yes. There's yes. 235 gallons. We actually get them the cardboard boxes, with the giant bladder. And okay. before they fill up the bladder, there's a heater that goes in the bottom. So when we get one of those in there, we just plug the thing in and it heats it up and up towards fluid eyes so it can um, pump, we can pump it out so, so that, it's like oh, a giant toothpaste basically well, i mean it's oh so much much thinner than that we we heat it up to about um uh, 104 degrees uh but just with the heater at the bottom leave it going for a day and it'll get it all working the, the pump can not can move it through pretty it's almost like maple syrup level maybe a little bit like oh. warm maple syrup it's of that viscosity uh, okay. so it's pretty fluid and uh we used to have a hot box and that we put all of our five gallon pails of honey in there. We put all of the drums that we had in there. And you know, this is before, I guess they have drum heaters, which would have been the easier way to go. How do you deal with the five gallon buckets? And so yeah. I just made a single block room with a bunch of like 250 watt heater lamps in there and uh, use that to heat the whole room up to about four, what is it, uh, like 116 degrees. Oh, that was our hot box. Yeah. And so uh, we got some, some aged, we actually both shaved some honey in there, like the crock pot version, but commercially by just leaving in there. So it got really dark and you could taste the, that like either, you know, when honey you've had for a long time, I've got some ancient honey, it's really, really dark. So I, I presume it oxidizes to some degree. Uh, it does change the flavor profile, but not necessarily badly, but it's not like the burning you would get. It's almost like those, those kind of reactions that you're getting in the crock pot from making mm -hmm. the boche. And, um, but it's just long-term. And one of the best ones we did recently was a collaboration with the uh, Lost Cause in San Diego. We used some orange blossom and been sitting around for like, 
three years in our hot box. And I was like, I couldn't really blend it in with anything else because it had a distinct flavor profile. We brulee some uh, pineapple on a grill with like sugar on top and just like hit it with tor torches, ground it all up, put that in there, fermented that, and then uh, put like rum spices in there and put it in a, a Jamaican rum barrel. So, oh man, that sounds but, so good. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it worked. It worked out pretty well. So. Yeah. Uh, so you're getting that Boshang kind of unintentionally. I mean, intentionally by leaving it in there, but. It was neglected honey, basically. It was kind of yeah. unlabeled, but I was like, I, I, I'm just pretty sure I knew what it was, but no one had put a label on it. I was like, all right, here's the stack of unlabeled five gallon honey. I don't know what they are. I'm trying to taste them, but sat in there and just on, on a pallet. It's like, all right, just sit in the box. Yeah. So, the experiment, no one knew. No, I didn't have any data on what happens if honey sits in a hot box for four years. What happens? It gets dark. And it changes yeah. the flavor. Okay, there you go. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Do you have a, um, a, in your personal world, a favorite type of honey to use? Obviously, there's like what you get for Meridian, but is there something that you wish you could just buy in droves? Yes. Uh, so I would say my favorite flavor profile North American honey is the hard to come by Tacoma, Washington, Metafoam honey. Oh, if you, yeah. If you haven't had Metafoam, it tastes mm -hmm. like cotton candy and toasted marshmallows. It's just a raw honey flavor profile. Uh, that's my favorite U.S. honey. Uh, orange blossom is the one we use because, you know, I used to get Florida orange blossom, which has a lot of salt palmetto, and it does taste uh, some, sometimes different from the blended stuff you get in California or Arizona. Mexico also has a different flavor profile. And it seems to me a very, it's very orangey. I would always call it orange blossom. It's really citrus blossom for a lot of parts. You know, they have those mm -hmm. mixed, mixed orchards and whatnot. And, uh, but this is, has a very strong orange flavor profile. It works. I like orange blossom for it being a monovarietal. It smells the most like the flower it comes from. Like orange blossom is a very potent kind of flower compared to like, let's say blueberries. Blueberries don't have a very potent flower at all. And uh, bees still get that, you get a unique honey, but it's it reminds me the most of the flower that it comes from just because that's a sm strong smell. It works with everything. It works with fruits and spices, like pretty much hands down across the board. And price-wise for getting a varietal honey, it's one of the better ones you know, clover is probably cheaper, but it's like orange blossom has a distinct flavor profile that's unique and you can tell that it's orange blossom comparatively to other honeys. So that's what, it's a workhorse. And that's why I like it the most. Uh, wildflower is just too, too non-repeatable. It depends, really height. It depends on the, the weather and you get the fall and the spring varieties differently. And, you know, if it's a small beekeeper try to do it local, it's like they never know what it is as a wildflower. And it's like, it may taste like, not the best so when, it, when that happens it's like garbage in garbage out you got to start with stuff that you know will ferment out and taste good even though it's cheap and it's local okay that's a small por portion of your portfolio to satisfy some people but if you're going to do it just as that your entire uniqueness i hope you have i hope you live in tacoma washington and you get metaphone as your like varietal like stuff that's super local to you but you know we you know, we're in texas i don't know if you much about where we are we have schizophrenic weather we don't have a lot of trees here and because of that, we don't have a lot of like tree honey. We get like Wahia out from West Texas, which is still like a six hour drive from Austin. So is that even local? I mean, it's regional, might as well be Mexico. That's where we go to Mexico. And that's regional for us too. Uh, but you know, we don't have any tree flowers. We're like in that range of not being wet enough and it's too hot, but yeah. it's not, it, it still freezes. So it's not good for like uh, tropical stuff. We're just not that big, so, so it's like, yeah. The meadow foam is like, I've had, I've only ever made a small batch because mm -hmm. I don't really have great access to it. And so I was able to get it one time online and uh, you're right. It is such an interesting and like um, just a wild variety to me because of those like cotton candy, I call it like fake sugary, like taste to me. It's, it's not fake sugar, but it has that same like, so it doesn't taste like honey. honey. That's the whole thing. You're just like, man, it feels like it's a candy. Yeah. It's got the profile that's like, this is this is delicious, but it feels like it's it's not real honey. Because you're so used to like clover and wallflower. And you have that, or just the ones that everybody has easy access to. Like blueberry honey is just, uh, it's it's closed, but it has its own little chain. Most of them are very subtle. There's a lot of them that are very subtle with that apple pear, warm spice kind of flavor profile. Mm -hmm. I'd say maybe 60% of them, but you start getting in the weird of had like a, a grease one that was very anise tasting. I was like, wow, that is strong licorice for just mm -hmm. the honey. And uh, so some, some are just 
odd balls like buckwheat buckwheat's are very strong nothing else really comes close to it it's just like boom so you you can find those flavor profiles of different plants but most of them get lumped in the center of like, like apple pear yeah kind of mellow honey so yeah i have a uh, i bought 30 pounds of buckwheat honey just to use and i'm still to this day that's a lot of buckwheat using it, it was a lot of buckwheat oh, i, I thirty yeah. pounds, about half, uh, uh, two and a half gallons so it's uh i mean you could you could make buckwheat traditionals but it is like getting hit in the face by a stack of hay like it is just a weird one so i've had a, my favorite buckwheat i had was somebody made a polish i'm gonna butcher the butcher name a bushnyak which is the you step feed it to the point where it's one part water and one part honey so by the time you end you would have start had a starting gravity of like 12 15 and when it mm. finishes it's like the starting gravity you would normally start with but you've got 14 percent abv but you're not adding you step feed it all in and that's a good that's a good challenge on figuring out how to use step feeding because uh, have, you, have you heard of Dell's uh, Dell Dell units D E L L E? Yes, I heard about them. I don't know much about them. So, uh, it's just it's the number to where yeast just peter out, right? They used it. They figured out that you could add, you could fortify wine and stop it so it's sweet. And they were like, "What's the ratio there?" So four and a half times your ABV plus your percent residual sugar, which is basically bricks uh, from a hydrometer. And so it's four and a half times your alcohol. So as alcohol, if you try to add a bunch of honey, when the alcohol is already high, it will just not, it, you'll exceed that. It's that number I think exceeds like 65. So you just do the calculation. If it exceeds 65, your yeast ain't coming back. You got to filter it and start from scratch. And like, they have to deal with the alcohol now, but they won't, they kick off proteins like, ah, this is too much. And yeah. nothing can really restart it. So that was a very interesting, but it's a good challenge to figure out how much honey you had left, left over and, when are you going to stick? You have to put more of it in up front and less and less and less until you used it all, all up. And that's a kind of interesting way. But buckwheat honey tastes it's very, you know, that chocolate that you shape like an orange and you break it open. It has like, the oh, yeah. it's, you know, how that chocolate orange kind of character. That's what it reminded me of. And so for buckwheat is that very earthy character. But when it was really so sweet at the end with a lot of booze, that orange character came out quite a bit. So if you have that, you want to challenge yourself. That's a good one. Yeah. It, the, yeah, it's devotion. D W O something Z I A K. That's a yeah. Polish one to one. But, That'd be interesting. And I mean, I gotta find a use for this stuff. So obviously, I can use it in some things, but it's pretty potent. Um, mm. Yeah, you talking about? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna get too sciencey. I'm gonna detract too. I'm. I'm. <laughs> I gotta stop myself. I no, want to yeah, ask yeah. you. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about. Um, you, you've got, like you said earlier with Meridian, you have your lighter ABV side things. And then um, you got also have your, I'm going to say heavier ABV, higher ABV. Um, in your world with the higher ABV things, how are you developing your, your recipes? Is it stuff that you guys are doing in small batches and then expanding on? Is it small series? What do you guys do? So in the beginning... Um... So first thing is that we've put that program on hiatus at this point. We outgrew our facility and we needed to put more tanks in and so we're already have a warehouse to put out. So we have put that on hold on indefinite hiatus until we move to a new facility. So everything's kind of legacy at this point. How did we start that? In the beginning, it all, um, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this one. Um, piloting. So I had a little pilot area for us. I have my knowledge base before as a home brewer that I'd had some recipes, but at some point you kind of run through your best ones. You're like, all right, I kind of have to look at what's up. When I used to do those, I would go online and look for different flavors. So in inspiration is one thing. Inspiration, I would look through things that were, let's say blueberries and blood orange. And I, was, I would say, is that a weird combo? Is that, does that sound apricots and, and Something savory would be savory with the tarragon. Apricots, tarragon. That sounds sweet, savory. Like, has anyone made dessert like that before? And if, if that's the case, what's the sugar ratio they would use huh. with a certain amount of stuff? And I'd go look at that. I was like, oh, there's like 10 recipes for this. I'm going to start grabbing some of those. And just like, that's my starting ratio. And I kind of have to convert that in my head. Like, what's practical from my knowledge base of making mead to like what I would like, what's 
I would, I would not use more than like say one whole clove per gallon. You know, like I knew a limit. So if I got a recipe that said like five cloves in this recipe for X amount of sugar, I'm like, well, first of all, I'm just going to cut everything by a fifth. We're just going to start yeah. there. And that's my to not exceed thing. And so you just get multiple recipes. And you just go at some point though, I'm going to commit. I got to pilot this out. And so you throw things in primary, you throw things in secondary. You kind of have to make that decision where I would just do first thing was to figure out my secondary. So I'd make a one gallon of base need. So I had a bunch of it sitting around. And since we double strength it in the beginning, I have like 10% to start with. So it's strong enough to do extraction. So like if I start over this, what would the flavor would be like? like so I'd do that for five days. It'd be typical for me to grind everything. Out. What can I get out of this? If it wasn't high enough in the, re in the ratio, that means I really could double it or 50% might just put, make notes. I'm like I'm gonna, next time I run this, I'm gonna do these changes to it. Then it would go back and say, okay, some of these I want kind of, uh, I did like a blackberry kind of thing. Like I really want more of that, that fermented blackberry characteristic, not so much the bright, the, the bright kind of sugary kind of like just a fresh strawberry and a blackberry and one kind of like a more subtle wide note. It's going to add the tannin. I'm looking for the tannins out of it as a mixture, but I want to get it from the fruit. So typically if you put fruit in secondary, you don't pick up the tannins. If you ferment them, you do. So if you're trying to get a balance in there, that's uh, especially anything with seeds, or you know, if you get purees, most of the time the seeds have been taken out, but if you're using IQF, you got all the seeds in there. So it kind of depends on that. So that pilot was the first one to do one gallon. Most of the time I just let it for five days. I don't even package it. I just kind of like, mm, I'm not even drinking this at any point and yeah. get rid of that. And I'll do a three gallon. Three gallons, sometimes five gallons. I'm just ready to commit and I've got options for it. I'll just do five gallons, see what it's like. Because then that next part of the experimentation is to figure out how fast I can find it. Like what's practical? I believe I totally believe in finding everybody's use gravity. I was like, man, find the best finding you can. It does not. Only thing it really might change is mouthfeel. Uh, but if you're going to try to stabilize it, you really want it to be as clear as possible. And I, you know, commercially, you don't have time for gravity. But you know, I would do filtration too. But I don't think finding does anything detrimental to it. Like basically, if fermentation is complete, drop all the fruit bits and yeast out of there as fast. I want to drink the stuff that the yeast manhandled. I don't want yeah. to drink the, that's just the way I like to see it, right? It's like, yeah. I'm big guys, but I look at them as a, as a process, like a, a instrument or a tool. Like if you're a yeast wrangler, they're live microbiota, but when you're done, I don't, I don't want you to find products. So all of our stuff, super filtered. Uh, yeah. Even the, uh, the cork ones too, the higher ABV. So, so that's, that, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the the pilot process. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And well, I wonder because obviously those, um, I feel like you can be even more of a mead artist in that regard. When you get to those, those uh, higher ABV ones, you guys have your standards, you know, your, your lower ABV stuff that that's going to be your, your stuff you make all the time. But I would see that as your playground. And so I, I just wondered, you know, how you, how you mess around in your playground. So that's absolutely it. Cause a lot of stuff, you know, my role was some production side of things. Like for the law, for a long time, I was a guy slinging it the hoses and pumping over and staying there and pumping all honey out. I kind of moved more to the pilot area to do a lot of my work and, and more of the, the, the management. Uh, it's not my favorite part of it, but I, there's just more opportunity and things. If the company is going to like continue to grow, that's I had to take opportunity to do that. But I had the pilot area. So when we were doing different kind of, we put out a rosé, we put out a coffee one. So I still do those pilots. And that the feed from where those flavor profile comes from is like a different part of our company because at first I thought it was going to be 50 50 percent revenue from the still meads and 50 percent from that it's like okay well how about even volume well no the volume we started doing more the lighter stuff and these days it's like even before we stopped it it was probably 98 percent of of the lower abd stuff that just that's what we do well and that's what that's what people wanted to distribute like they go, oh, oh yeah. this is the, this is different, and I, we know people drink cider, but no one's drinking sweet wine. So a few people break through into that, but most of them have a very difficult time breaking through onto that. Like to be to the if they can't sell it, they want their margins on it. If they can't, it's a hard sell. Then it just rolls back to what I was talking about, like treating the people that are directly buying from you to either the bar owner or the distributor or whatever. They are a customer. If you can't convince them, you aren't going anywhere. So yeah. there's like a whole different approach to those guys they, they want to talk more numbers and so yeah. and also i mean obviously it's more expensive to do the higher abv stuff but i do feel like there's a little bit of a fork 
for people. I agree. Uh, I agree. There so- is. The, the, the creative side of that, I enjoy making the higher ABV, but they just don't sell at the same rate. Like people like Superstition or um, Garage East or Pips or all these, like those guys have the hype train that they do it like strong and they, they got out there and they, they have the hooks and most of that demographics are bottle traders. I'd say people that are on BA and they're swapping stuff. And, you know, those are the ones looking for the uniqueness of small bottles. We, we, for whatever reason, didn't, weren't able to attain that. And so as a result, you start looking at what's paying the bills and providing money for you to buy more equipment. And you start going, well, I should probably focus on that one a little bit more. And uh, as much as I like making those, we just kind of, we were doing it on a regular, try to do like three of them every three months. And that's a pretty rough click because if you're making three of them, none of them can suck. And I'm so totally beat myself up over things that go poorly. And I'm like, whoa, this is a single, basically one, I did one pilot for all of those last year. And like outside of our standard ones we would do, it was like one pilot is like, Next one's, we're going up, we're going up to the plate. Next one, here we go. Boom. And you know, like I was talking about trying to hit 59 gallons and sometimes be under by five and over by 15. It's like, ah, just trying to guess a fruit. So yeah. it's, it's more fun. It's more creative to, but that just go, rolls back into previous experience of how much fruit and spices you want to use for the history of what you've made. So go make a bunch of different stuff and learn and experiment and keep that catalog of the tasting notes after the fact. Um, yeah how to do it so and i I mean i love that you guys uh, i've had some of your higher abv stuff and i i found it really great um it's a bummer to hear that you guys have put it on pause but i have no doubt that when you expand and um you'll get back to that little playground i think that'll be that'll be fun for you guys it'll be for people that come to like we've never had an i we've never really had a nice tasting room. It's like all of our money that we had to spend was spent on the equipment. When you walk into our facility, you know, like a little office in the front, you kind of go down, you op- goes right to the warehouse. And when you walk down right to the warehouse, there's a trench drain that runs right down the middle of the line. On the left side are all the tanks. And on this side was a big open slab with just a true cooler with a you know, two door true cooler and a big board back behind there in the three wash sink. It just looked like it, you know, just crappy tables out there. We did not spend money in it at all. And so when we come back around to that, to a larger place, you know, COVID, a lot of people didn't make it through COVID. So there's a lot of commercial stuff up there. And we're looking at two different ones right now and trying to talk to designers about the layout. And so we're, we're in the process of trying to move it out there. And when we do move it out there, then we'll have it kind of a, a conducive tasting room to where I can make those small batches again at that size and we know how many case counts and what to expect on the burn rate on that. Cause we just were never set up for that. Our tasting room, that's why COVID didn't hit us very hard. We were, we spent most of our time on distribution and trying to cast a really wide net to try to get our name and honey as a beverage being cool. And no one has problem with barley grapes or apples, but why honey is this, I don't know. It's going to be sweet already. It's like, we have to understand how fermentation works. It consumes all that sugar. So you don't, you can make it bone dry. You can make it dry as anything else out there. It doesn't taste that good, but I can make it that way. And yeah. um, so it, w- the fact that I was making multiple products that I thought were top notch, I think you could sell this to anybody that was drinking cider is like, this is as good. This is, this is an A plus for a new category. And it certainly is a contentious thing uh, compared to like seltzers. How the hell did seltzers, other than seltzers being cheap, uh, you know, the flavor profile of our stuff versus their stuff, even our lower ABV, we have a, a new product line that's like kind of in the better for you, like 100 calories. And so mm-hmm. 100 calories in a, ten, in, a, in a 12 ounce glass, about 75% of that's the cal- 75 calories out of 100 are just from the alcohol in there. So there's yeah. not a whole lot of room to dial up from bone dry using yeah. some kind of food character. How do you do that with honey though? Because honey... I mean, I don't know. This this is a t- t- big question. I don't know. Nutritionally, when you ferment honey, are the calories not still there? You know what I mean? I know that you meat is a high alcohol, calorie. Basically, converted alcohol, that's where the calories are basically gone to. The sugar, so if you're the staying at that alcohol. 5%, then you're just staying below. You're staying at 75 to 100 well, 75 calories. calories. Just If I produce, if I take orange blossom, uh, go through the fermentation process and produce alcohol from that, there's it's dry as far as sugar content goes. No more carbs. 
Yeah. So what did that do? It turned into alcohol. So now I have 4% ADV. 4% ADV equals 75 calories, right? Oh. So out of 100, just 4% alcohol, if it was bone dry, I only have 25 calories to basically work with to get a flavor profile that tastes better than seltzers. So interesting. And, yeah, and that's, that, was, that was my goal. So that's where I get to do, that's currently the kind of experimentation I get to do. I love that. Uh, that's so on, cool. It's more sciencey. Okay, so speaking of things going dry, do you, uh, I'm guessing you and your big batches, your base batches of mead, do you let them go dry, stabilize, and then come back and, of course, hit it with flavorings and sweetness? Is that it's, your general? Yeah, exactly. It, all my recipes are, like I said, analogs. All my recipes were initially designed as analogs to other things people would buy in, in, the, in the bottle shop. And so I didn't want them, I wanted them different sweetnesses. I didn't want my, the dry hopped one. I didn't want the people I was going to make an analog for the people that wanted to hang out with the craft beer guys, but couldn't drink beer because they allergic to barley and how he's had to drink like red bridge or some other like gluten-free beer. And like, I just want hops. So I was like, I can get you a thing. But if they said, even beer drinkers that got drugged by their significant others who wanted to go drink the sweet stuff, I got to give them kind of an option to be able to go for it. If it was sweet, I would totally get docked by those guys. So I'm like, all right, I, I won't have this conversation with you. You can't say it's too sweet. It's going to be, it's going to be off dry. And yeah. I, I'm going to make it taste good off dry with a lot of hops in it. So you guys have like, oh, damn, that's pretty good. And yeah. so as long as I get that feedback, then that was you know, the, the point of it. Hello, podcast listeners and watchers. If you are enjoying this podcast, check out my Patreon. It is patreon.com slash manmade mead. For two bucks a month or more, if you want to support the channel more, you can gain exclusive access and early access to all of my videos. You can also support the channel, help me create new content, and rest easy know knowing that I am able to do more with this mead community. I hope that you enjoy this podcast and I hope you will come and support me on Patreon if you'd like even more me content. Well, it's interesting. So I um, obviously homebrew myths, mead myths of people talking about not wanting to use sorbates and sulfites for their own oh. reasons. Um, I heard that people uh, could taste them. So I put it to the test. I did like a, like a half gallon, four little half gallons. I put sorbate in one, metabisulfite in another, both of them in one, and then left a control. And I sent it off to some friends to taste test to see if they could actually taste it. It was the normal and, usage, like the, the, what they tell you to use? Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, by the package. I just went by the package. But so one so sorbate, had, one sulfite, and one with both. Okay. Yes, and then a control. And I just, I put a number on them. And so I didn't tell them what was what. I tried, I had them do like a test where they did three rounds and they had to try to identify the nothing and give their notes. But my findings were that it was, it was pretty tough to, to nail down any taste. It was only about a third of the time did anybody guess it correctly. What is that? Just guessing? I was like, ah. Yeah. So, what, tight, so it good enough. But yeah. That was the big thing I, I had heard. Um, I'm all, I love mead myths. That's like my big, one of my passions is, is just diving headfirst into all these silly things. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I just go crazy with the numbers, but uh, I just found that interesting. I, and uh, I think people are scared off by sorbates and sulfites because of obviously their, their chemical nature and people don't want to include things, especially coming from the Viking style of brewing. So I would say a couple things about that. What's not a chemical? Because everything <laughs> H2O yeah. is a chemical. Uh, you know, if you read that PDF on the sorbic acid, the first thing it talks about is the history of sorbic acid. It was initially refined from the mountain ash tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it tells a little bit of history about, like, in the Civil War, American Civil War time, like 1857 or something like that. But they, some, some chemist first, so now they synthesize it, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but was, that's where it, was, it does occur naturally. Yeah. We don't have enough trees, I suppose, to go grinding them up to try to make sorbic. Like, oh, this is effective. It gets a thing. Can we synthesize? It's like synthetic chemistry. But I'm a science person, so I don't really get bent out of shape. And they say it's a preservative. It doesn't, it doesn't kill anything. It just prevents yeast from budding. So if yeah. you put it into a carboy with a lot of yeast into it, the yeast, which is probably at maximum level, is not going to be budding at that point anyway. And you put any more sugar in there, and there's a giant colony in there. You're just going to eat it. You're just preventing them from making more friends. So you have to get off of the friends 
and family. They won't, if there's a few cells and you add sorbates to a bunch of you know, normal amount to very few cells in there, then it won't do anything. But it's a preservative in that way. It doesn't function on the human body the same kind of way. It just keeps yeah. microbes from growing. So, when I, um, I, I'm, I want people to brew how they want. And of course, I think if you are attempting, let's say a historical mead and you want to keep true to not using those things, that's fine. But I see this, this new uh, era of mead as we continue to learn more about it and make more of it. We have just so many tools and, you know, you talked about the nutrient wasteland and like things like Fermate O, Fermate K and, and Dimonium Phosphate, all this stuff that's been developed to help yeast thrive it seems silly not to use the tools that uh, people have created, even if, you know, you don't like them. So. Yeah. You know, I, I understand that from a homebrew level. It's like, uh, I, I totally get that. And, and I do want to recreate historical challenges stuff. Oh man. People, I don't know who's doing that. Please to kill me. Um, historically go for it. You're going to have to, you're going to have to figure out what we've learned modern wise and try to alleviate that the way they did historically, right? They had like, they added their yeast by a, like a piece of stick that they stirred in there. They had no idea what yeast was. They didn't know it was microbiological. They had the little uh, faceted, uh, look like a, a, a vertebrae ring. Have you ever seen that before? The Viking? And they would just chuck it in there. The yeast would go and it would infiltrate that. And that's what they said. They would move on to the next one. Since they had like a family stick that was totally impregnated. And so you mixed all your honey and whatnot and you stir it in there. And it would just start going because you inoculated it with a favored yeast that was kept around there. The yeast that they can grow up there is all from cold weather, which tends to give you a much nicer, like to Texas, there's no, we don't have fruit trees and what you're picking up in the air for wild culture is pretty gnarly. It's yeah. not flavorful. Um, so depends on where you're, where you're trying to do it. The show me I hear that, that was just basically adding maybe, you know, lemon and and raisins for the purposes of trying to get that stuff done. And uh, you can do those. They will go a whole lot slower. The more fruit you add into it, the better off you're going to go with it. You learn how to step. Don't piss off your yeast. That's the whole goal. Like as soon as you add the honey and water and you add the yeast, you are a yeast wrangler. You want to give them the most nutrients that they, they need to have and provide the least toxic area. So that's why we do this degassing aeration to try to like, get all i have my theory about why that is is that you know um but there's these techniques that you have if you understand what we're doing with modern methodologies you can probably recreate that historically and so stabilization that dell units thing i was talking about like when you get the adv up high enough and you add enough sugar to where that number gets to 65 you don't need to stabilize it because the yeast aren't going to come back from that. Just let it settle, and it really isn't going to go south on you. It's not going to restart. You you made it such a stressful environment between the alcohol percentage and how much residual sugar in there. If that's that's a way to do it, and that, that's that's why they did it. I still think that the style that we make and what Ethiopians still drink is Tedge, which is still fermenting but lower ABV. It's got higher residual sugar. It's still bubbly. It's full of yeast, so it gets you a lot of gut bubbles. But I think the Vikings probably drank that while it was still fermenting. And that's probably where they're drinking at the damn meat halls. And it was after a giant the go over and come back, you know, Viking, whatever. Then they're just like, they're, tomorrow's not the battle. The battle's been won and we're drinking with all the people that made it. We're going to drink the stuff out of the vats that we've been holding on for a long time. But while they're making it, I'm sure they were scooping it off. I have a book called, uh, I forget what the book is. It's, uh, oh, it's killing me. It's a mead book. Anyway, it's like a red book with a white, a yellow lettering on it. It's got a really good historical front end on it saying like how far it goes back. The original ale was honey before we learned how to cultivate barley and learn how to like turn it into it. And before even grapes. So when they figured out barley was a way cheaper sugar than honey was, there's like, well, we're just going to make that. That became the new ale. They added hops to it, and that became beer. Like in the sense that that was just the sweet sugar water changed from honey, changed over to barley. They go, oh, let's add a bearing agent to back it off. It's like now we have hops. Hops is a thing. That's beer. And yeah. so the progression of it's kind of interesting to go back through. On, on that. No, I think that's – it's important to know – I think it's important for us to always call back to those times and to realize, you know, the history of mead. Um, but just like you guys are doing, we, we are progressively making mead 
uh, into a better and better thing and to be more accessible. And I don't think that handing somebody um, a Tej as their first mead style ever is going to be the selling point to get them into mead making or drinking mead in general. So like obviously Meridian is, you guys are well known for your lower ABV stuff and I uh, I personally have enjoyed it. You talked about the rosé. I'm trying to think what other ones I had. It's been about a year now since I've had them. So my brain is... Yeah, the the, the rosé wasn't... I mean, everybody was doing rosé. So that's one of those ones that's kind of a market-driven. Like, I want to do it because I make the recipes, or I think they're I think they're interesting, like blueberry, blood orange, or some, yeah. some weird stuff. Like, uh, But everything that drives our, our canned stuff is more of like looking at national trends. It's all market-driven on that side. And uh, so they're like, we want, everybody else is doing rosé. And I kind of roll my eyes like, oh, what do you mean by rosé? Do you want grapes in this thing? Like what, what, and so what I typically do for that is I'll go get everybody on the market that has a thing of the flavor profile I'm about to make. And I'll do my judging tasting notes on them all. And I'll find out which, which I think is the strongest. What do I like about all of them? And then the marketing people tell me which one sells the most. I'm like, okay, this one sucked, but it sells the most. Why is that? And they go looking at the marketing budget for them. Like these guys are all over the place. You know, I'm looking like um, Angry Orchard and Woodchuck and this all the whole Ace and all those different guys that make like a rosé. And I was uh-huh. like, okay. And I start looking through the ingredients in the backside. I'm like, purple, t- uh, purple potatoes. People were using just all you know, random things in here. Some people were just berry. And I was like, what does it mean to be rosé? It just means it needs to be pink. Oh, and by the, the, we're trying to do the Texas directive. Like, uh, let's use Texas grapefruit. And I'm like, you want a rosé with grapefruit, and all it has to be is pink. I'm like, let me get on that. So uh, I was like, cherry. Out of all the ones I tasted, cherry was a profile. I was like, because I would try to identify strawberry cherry was predominant. And I tried a couple of dry wines, too. And I'm just trying to find acidity levels. What are people expecting? Like, what is, what is the baseline for rosé? Then I'm like, what is everybody else made from cider? Like, none of you guys are really making anything close to like the three wines that make. you aren't close at all, really. So I'm like, okay, find out what that thing is. And I think, what did I end up doing with that? It was grapefruit, uh, dark cherry, and there was one other thing. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, but it was kind of like, you know, 60% flavor profile, 30% flavor profile, 10% flavor profile. And it's like, you have that layering where it's not monodimensional. And uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's well, that's weird. an important point for all mead making is um, regardless of how high your ABV, you want it to be three-dimensional or multi-layered. Every good mead I've ever had will linger for a while. You, you drink it and you, you kind of go through like a three to five second little process. The stuff that goes down in one or two seconds to me is good, you know, can be good, but I don't have as much enjoyment for it. I like to really go through the experience of it. And so... Um, I do vividly remember when I went through you guys' stuff, um, I I was a little skeptical at first because I was like, this is like going to be, you know, six to seven percent or, you know, five to seven percent, whatever, lower ABV. It's going to be like super thin. And then I was pleasantly surprised you guys had filled out the body. You guys had created a product that like it, it felt full. It, had, it was very flavorful. It wasn't just like a watery mess, which is what my brain immediately thought with like a a low, low ABV mead like that. So That's the first thing I ever made when I started doing these, the very first one I made was exactly what, like, like water. It was like, mm-hmm. man, there's a reason why no one's doing this. And I was like, okay, let me use my beer making techniques and my, what I've learned from the winemakers do to boost it up. So basically it's some addition to tannins and acid. You know, that's really, if you, if you start tracking those numbers and looking at why people drink certain things and break down what's on the market as best you can to give yourself a metric, then you have to hold yourself to that same kind of metric. So the more you can look at something that's similar to yours, it's like mm-hmm. you have basically benchmark it. Benchmark yeah. your product versus ever popular things or things that you see that you appreciate, that you want to be not, not a clone of, but you want to compete for those same dollars. Basically, to grab a market share of those guys. Well, I got, so I'm attempting my first ever, I'm trying to do a 4% mead. Um, and so, and I, I got a kegging setup for the first time in my life. I've been nice. bottle carving everything. So I'm kind of stepping up uh, and I have this, this little experiment going along, but um, I'm very inspired by what you guys do. And I know that um, I, I'm hopeful, I should say, that I will be able to get down and, and see you guys, even if it's before you move to a big place, I would love to just come and chat again and and see what you guys are doing because you guys are putting out great stuff and you're 
your reach is so large for this demographic. Um, I have no doubt that you guys are making a huge impact on the mead scene by right. helping introduce people with a product that is, it, it is exactly what mead is and should be, but it's not, I'm going to harken back to the Tej. It's not a, uh, you know, in your face style that is more niche. You guys are really nailing it. So. So I've got the, I've, I've certainly had the conversations when you go to like mead festivals and like most people have the, I'll get the guys, you know, with the Viking kind of aesthetic and they're like, not, they don't consider our stuff mead. Do you have anything that's stronger, bolder? It's like, I kind of look at it like this. Pilsner and Russian Imperial Stout are both beers. You couldn't get further away from each other on residual sugar, ABV, brightness, Sugar, I mean, just whatever it is, they are both still made of the same raw ingredients. So I kind of, in the mead spectrum, most people are making the big high ABV ones because they, without necessarily adding anything to it, are more shelf stable in the long run. We have to go through filtration and just and stabilize at the same time and force carbonate it. So it's not the old school way, it's modern. We call it modern mead. It's like, now that we have all these tools, we're going to do it this way, but you kind of have to be able, you can't really recreate what we do unless you have a keg instead of, because you can't, you can't do it the, at the sweetness levels or at least the residual sugar amounts that we have naturally. It's just, yeah. Diminished that. Without getting into like some, um, it, like it's called erythritol or other, those things that really, and, and that's a whole other thing where people don't want right. to use those things. It, so it's, it's, it's beyond what most people like, and like, can you just make it easy? Beer just stops. It goes 75, 78% of the way and it says, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. So um, yeah. honey, not so much. It, it goes all the way to the bottom every time unless the ABV is high enough or you stabilize it or pasteurize it. But Yeah. Well, I think that you know how to do the higher ABV stuff. And I mean, you guys aren't able to do it right now because of your setup, but that doesn't mean that you're not equipped to do that. And I, I'm excited to... Um, to see what you guys do when you do move, because I'm curious to see what stuff you'll put out with even even more space and even more um, artistic time, so to speak. Yeah, so. well, mostly I'm using some of this, like uh, basically I've kind of rolled back the piloting kind of to my house. And um, yeah. just because it's just easier, I have, I have my control fermentation fridges just to play around with like three gallon batches. I can get honey all day long and I can just go get the fruit from, you know, Whatever I can, I can have all the ingredients. The ingredients part isn't hard. It's more the space to do it and move it around and taking the time to see how long it needs to do stuff. Because for the longest time, it was rush, 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 rush. I felt I put some products out a little rushed. Now you can put it in a you know people that buy the stuff often are doing it for special occasions. So they're in general most people ninety five percent of people when they buy it they drink it. I'd say that's most of them, but people that buy mead a lot seem to hold on to it for bottle shares or special occasions mostly. So me putting out there super early or, you know, it, it'll come into its own and the longer you hold, you know, it's, but I don't even know what it tastes like after it's been aged. I'm like, everything's super fresh. It's like, it tastes kind of a little too sharp right now, but that'll probably roll off. So he drinks it right now, will be disappointed. And I never really got much feedback on some of my stuff that I put out earlier than I would probably have liked, but I mean, the flavor profile was good. It was all filtered down, but there's some some integration that still happens over even though you filter it. There's stuff that that's why I don't think finding really removes much stuff. There are things that will find its way to recoalesce in there, even if you filter down to really the molecules that carry flavor are mostly really, really, really tiny, and uh, they go through filters, and you're just picking up all the debris and and microbiological stuff. So, well, the time that um uh, 15% mead takes over, or excuse me, the flavor development of years on a 15% mead is, is important because time is its own like mellowing factor with ABV. I mean, I, that kind of 15% can hit you right in the face for the first year or so, or, or more, depending on what you've done and how many fusels yeah. you got. Um, and so I, I do think that, well, when you guys are in a production stage, you kind of have to get the stuff out. You can't just have a pallet full of stuff. Otherwise you're, you're stuck. You got so. Deadlines and whatnot. You tell yeah. people you're going to, you got to have release dates and you're like, ah, you got to get it out by now. And so yeah. time's just taking away. You're like, ah, yeah. It's, it's crazy but, time. No, I think you guys are, are, um, I love what you're doing. And I also love 
that you guys are super easy to access as far as like shipping, at least for, for me, there are not many places uh, in the US that ship to Oklahoma. We're kind of a, a desert in our own little meat sphere. So you guys have a, a, um, a meat sphere of people making it here, but also in shipping. There's not a lot of people. It's kind of popping up. But yep. I do want to ask, what, where can people um, find your stuff? Are there are you guys in Total Wine? I know you guys do some Vino Shipper stuff, I believe. Yeah, so online we do Vino Shipper, and we reach out to whoever we can. So Vino Shipper has all the licenses to go to, so they're basically a middleman. So whatever licenses to whatever states they go to, that's the only way we can get them out. We are distributed in 10 other states, or eight other states right now, I suppose. So like Arizona, Tennessee, uh, Colorado, Georgia, Florida. Uh, New York City. Um, I'm trying to think of a, uh, I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, Michigan, uh, to name a few. And so, in those places, we're trying to, you know, we have different size distributors. The places we first started off, typically we still have the same small distribution there. Obviously, New York City, very small distribution on that. But like Michigan and Colorado, we have guys that reach out pretty reasonably large. Mm -hmm. And we're on the state of Texas too. So, we try to populate our, our grocery stores here, which is HEBs. Uh, as much as possible. And so we've got a really good relationship with, with our grocery store uh, in the area, which is helps out a lot for getting it out there. People come into the town and they find it like, oh, that's pretty cool. And um, the information gets out. It's just, it took a long time. It took, I was really hoping the name Meridian Hive and our product was going to be a little bit more well known after, I mean, what Austin, the metro area is like 2 million, uh, 1.8 million people, something like that. So mm -hmm. how long does it take to get to the point where every big, bar knows that you've at least been there and like that took a long time but i think after like five five six years i could have random conversations like yeah i have a company that makes booze meridian high like oh i've seen your stuff at the store so you know it took a while before yeah. people just scanned it saw it looks interesting i've seen it before i've never tried it and so there's a lot of people that we just just never really tried it so liquid lips is what we call that whole thing of getting it into people's mouths it's like samples Wherever legally possible, sample stuff out. That's the only way you're going to get – it's the fastest way to get conversion. Of people yeah. like, you, know, you go to the grocery store, you can do promos, and you give them samples. They're like, oh, that's way better than I expected. They don't buy it. That's fine. At least I changed the perception of our product versus what they thought it was. Yeah, Maybe there's a chance now, though. They'll, they'll go and buy it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just change the mind about it. Just like, oh, that's way better than I thought it was going to be. That's the best. That makes me feel the best after starting this with no market research on it. Like, you're going out there where no one's gone before. And I was like, man, every time somebody says, this is way better than I thought it was going to be. And that's like 90% of the people, not more than 90% of the people that have never had a need or had our stuff. And that's mm -hmm. way better than I expected it would be. So like you said, the thin body, and you're like, oh, that tastes way better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Happens a lot. Well, so I, um, I want to make sure and plug, I'll put a bunch of links down below too for, for Meridian Hive. You guys have a website and then of course there's, I'm sure there's Vino Shipper links and all that stuff for buying if you're trying to do that. If you're in Texas, of course, around the Austin area or just traveling, go check out, check them out. Um, Mike, I appreciate your time. I have loved getting to do this and I, I can see your passion for it. And I, I do love your engineer um, mindset and your uh, you're you are very sciencey. Like I'm, I'm not as sciencey as you, but I I want to be as sciencey as you and understand. And so, like my brain, I've had so much fun getting to talk to you about these things. I'm Great. sure we could have we could have unpacked a ton of stuff. I had to kind of stop myself in the middle because I was uh, I was about to go down a whole different avenue, but. Um, I, I want to say anyone who wants to try some great mead that is undoubtedly going to uh, not only further your opinion of mead, but also help your friends understand it more, go check out Meridian Hive. Um, it's a great gift. It's also a great thing to just buy and support. So support Meridian Hive and make sure that you are uh, always trying to make more mead or consume more mead. That's kind of my <laughs> That's a little send off there. <laughs> so thank you, Mike. I appreciate your time. Cheers.